Welcome to the Teachers on Fire podcast, where 21st century educators come to share, learn, and be inspired. We believe in the growth mindset, creativity, communication, critical thinking, collaboration, and strategic uses of education technology. Our mission is to share news and views from teachers who are crushing it in the classroom and making a difference for learners everywhere. I'm your host, Tim Cavey. Let's jump into today's episode. Today, I'm speaking with John Harper. John is the vice principal at Sandy Hill Elementary School in Cambridge, Maryland. He's also the smooth sounding voice hosting the My Bad podcast and the co-host of the Teacher's Aid podcast. You can follow John on Twitter at John Harper 70 BD. John, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Are you ready to talk education? Tim, I am ready and I'm still, I had to hold my chuckle back when you said smooth sounding voice. I've never been described like that, but I'll take it, man. I'll take it. (laughs) Oh man, this is kind of surreal for me, uh, having you in my my earbuds and and in the car, listening to both of the podcasts I mentioned. It's, It's pretty special for me to be chatting with you. So thanks for joining me today, John. Hey, it's my honor to be here with you. Fantastic. Why don't you start, John, by telling us a little bit more about your current context. Just uh, set it up for us. What's your school all about? What does it look like? Sure. I'm an assistant principal at Sandy Hill Elementary School. It's, I guess what people would say, a small school on the eastern shore of Maryland. We serve students uh, pre-K to five, have about 400 students. We are, I would say, 70% African-American 20% Caucasian and about 10% Hispanic. And even though it's on the rural Eastern Shore, we encounter a lot of the same issues that, in other words, urban areas do because there's just different pockets that are have, have a lot of needs, have a lot of needs. And I work with an amazing team and you know, I'm fortunate to work with them every day and we get to serve these students every single day. And it's just an honor to work with the team that I have. Awesome. Awesome. Now, which one came first, the My Bad podcast or Teacher's Aid? My Bad. My Bad definitely came first. That's probably been about, gosh, maybe three years now. It's I guess I've recorded over 120 episodes of My Bad. That started about maybe three or four years ago. And that's something I'm very passionate about. And then over the last year, I've begun Teacher's Aid. You know, I co-host that with an amazing educator, Mandy Fralick. And You know, we do that. We release that probably every other week or every three weeks. And that's been a lot of fun too, but they're very very similar in topics and about social emotional issues. Well, I do want to ask you further, John, about sort of what each show is all about, but uh, that your My Bad podcast, I know, touches on growth mindset. And I've listened to a number of episodes. It's sort of focused on this idea that we all fail, right? We all make mistakes and we face adversity of different kinds, sometimes of our own making. So, on that note, John, tell us about a low moment that you faced somewhere along your education journey and then how you overcame it. Sure. I mean, my, my biggest thing with my bad is I want people, I do want people to learn from the mistakes, but my, my biggest takeaway that I hope is that people listen to my bad and they realize that they're not alone. And so the mistake, my biggest mistake took place probably, I think it was maybe four years ago. It's before I started my bad. And I literally had a mental breakdown. The the stress of school and some stresses in life just got to the point where they overtook me so much. I, I didn't get out of bed for two days hmm. and I was a mess. And my mistake in that was that I, I kept all of this hidden. I didn't, I didn't reach out to others. I mean, obviously I leaned on, you know, my wife and my kids for support, but I kept that to myself. And, you know, I've since learned that there's so many people out there that experience similar events and have similar stresses and anxieties and different depressions. And, you know, we think sometimes by admitting this or by reaching out that it's a sign of weakness. But when really, I have found that vulnerability is like a strength. It's almost like a superpower. And what helped me get through, there were a couple of different educators who put some pieces out there. Two in particular, uh, Joe Maza did a TED talk in which he talked about anxiety. And I just found it incredibly powerful. And then Nicholas Provenzano, the nerdy teacher, did a piece on depression that he was suffering through. And I thought, you know what? These guys put that out there. I need to do the same thing. And so I, I wrote a piece called The Masks We Wear, in which I talked about you know, the fact that I had been wearing a mask for so long and having, and having anxiety. 
And the response was amazing. I mean, so many people reached out and said, you know, thanks so much for putting that out there. I experienced the same thing. And it made me realize that, you know, a lot of us go through the same things and yet we're reluctant to share that. We think that no one else could possibly be feeling this way or no one else could possibly make this same mistake. And it's just, it's comforting to know that, you know, our our PLN, our tribe, our friends, our colleagues, whatever you want to call it, they're going to be there for us. And they want to be there for us, but for some reason, we're reluctant to reach out. And so my big mistake was not reaching out and leaning on others for support. That is very well put, John. I think you're right. Those are universal issues and challenges for just about all educators. I I was just listening to one of your recent guests, and she was describing her pathway to administration and a PhD, and just talking about some of the collective guilt that she felt along the way, and even still suffers today from time to time in terms of, you know, the, the time she spent with her own children. And even though I'm sure she was a wonderful mom, she still sort of articulated that struggle, right, that goes on. And and you're right. I think there's so much power in just sharing our journey and sharing some of the challenges, some of the mistakes that we've made along the way and that realization that, hey, I'm not the only one here. And there's there's power in that. Absolutely. I mean, I think we see that in, I guess, one time. One example I can think of, we see that in the military a lot. I think, I mean, you you watch videos or we see movies in which individuals go through these incredible basic trainings and these incredible regiments. And we think, why on earth do people want to put themselves through that? Why do they want to go back? But I mean, they're such a cohesive and strong unit that they know they're together and they have each other's backs. And I think that's the thing as teachers we need to do. We need to know, and we do know that we have each other's backs and that we're not alone. Now, John, I shared that you've been hosting two podcasts. We've talked a little bit about My Bad. Tell us more about Teacher's Aid with Mandy Freilich. What is that one all about and what can teachers expect to hear in that show? Teacher's Aid basically takes on the social, the intense social emotional issues that teachers have. You know, a lot of what we hear today, a lot of what's on Twitter, a lot of what we read about is about putting students first. And we to start off the program with a little maybe 15 second blurb and we compare it to the airline steward or stewardess when they say you know you have to give yourself oxygen first before you give it to the child if you're traveling with a child or something like that and i think it's that and we think it's the same way in education Mm. but a lot of times and for many years the needs of educators have been kind of neglected in other words that the burned out teacher i mean i've had teachers i mean you see it. I mean, teachers come to school, they're exhausted, they're tired, they're working two and three jobs. I've had teachers come to me and apologize for having to leave. And then they proceed to tell me that, you know, they just threw up in the bathroom, they were sick. And then they they say, I'm sorry, I have to leave. I say, don't ever apologize, you know, or they apologize because they have to go home and take care of a sick child or a sick family member. And it's just what teachers can expect, what educators can expect when they listen in are tips from experts on how how they can feel better and how they can better take care of themselves. For example, a recent episode, or actually we had a, we had a two-part series that was really good with, with Dan Pink on there and talked about time management. because so He's got a recent book on that, on time management. He came on and just talked about better ways to manage time. We had an episode with KJ Delantonio, who just published a book about parenting. And she talks about how to help deal with uh, the guilt that parents feel, very similar to the episode that you listened to recently on My Bad with Melissa Nixon. And so basically it takes on issues that are pretty intense that educators feel. And it's just, hopefully when when educators hear this, it it helps them a little bit because it's not getting any easier, that's for sure. And if if we ignore the social emotional issues that educators have, I mean, we're, we're seeing the results of that. I mean, the number of applicants in ed programs, the number of applicants for teaching positions are going down every year. And so we got to take better care of ourselves. Yeah, I heard some of the Daniel Pink episode, John, and he is so amazing. So just a, a little plug in particular for that one, but uh, love the show. And you're right. You know, we talk about it's all about the learning and our learners. And there's a lot of truth to that, but we need to take care of our own. We need to put on that oxygen mask first. So, John, as you think about growing and improving in your own professional practice, what is one professional goal or area that you're hoping to work on this year? I am trying to, and I guess it's 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 sort of two, but it's it, they're combined. I'm, I need to become more organized and procrastinate less because what I have found is that when I procrastinate, it causes me it causes me stress. In other words, I'll have, for example let's say I have a project I have to do, or I have an observation I have to write up and I think about it and I think, well, I won't do it. 
and then I stress about it instead of just sitting down for the hour, hour and a half and just doing it. And so what I'm trying to do is chunk the assignments that I have or chunk the work that I have to do and stop putting things off. Because really the time that I spend worrying about it, I could just spend doing it. And not only do I get things done faster, but then I don't procrastinate. I don't put it off. And being organized has helped this. I've tried to put things on a calendar, trying to stay very regimented with that because I'm not a very organized person. But you know that excuse only goes for so for so long. I mean, I've got to get things done as the assistant principal of a building. So I'm trying to be more organized and procrastinate less. Sounds good. And I can't wait to get into some of the specifics there. I'll come back to productivity in a minute here. But first, John, what is it that excites you about education today? This could be kind of a big picture idea as you take the aerial view of education, or maybe it's something on the micro level happening right there in your classrooms? I think it's a big picture and item in that I'm seeing more and more educators being vulnerable and putting themselves out there. And I don't just, I'm, I'm not referring to my show. I mean, I obviously on my bad educators are vulnerable, but I'm seeing more and more of that through blog pieces and podcasts. People are sharing sides that they normally wouldn't wouldn't share in years past. I mean, and you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, social media is often where everyone shows their best, their highlight reel, you know, the airbrush version of what we want people to think. But what I'm seeing more and more of are people sharing their missteps and their mistakes. And I think that's good because it, it lets people know they're not alone. And I think it's going to draw more people to social media because they don't think it's a place where you have to be perfect all the time. So that, that excites me. Are you familiar with Brene Brown's work, John? Oh my gosh, Tim, she <laughs> is a goddess. <laughs> Brene Brown is a goddess. Oh. She is unbelievable. She might be the most brilliant woman on the earth. Yeah. Besides my wife. Besides my <laughs> wife. But she is but she is amazing. I mean, her work is incredible. I've got one of her audio books. I've got another book on the way. I'm, I watch everything I can that she's on. She's just she's brilliant. I mean, she's brilliant. She's funny. It's just yes. So I guess that, that's a long answer to yes. She's amazing. She is amazing. I, you know, I've heard her on the Tim Ferriss podcast. I've been seeing the quotes from her on Twitter for a long time. I'm just finally getting into one of her books, Dare to Lead. And it's just like highlight after highlight. It's incredible and so much wisdom. Definitely recommend Brene Brown. If you're not familiar with her work, you need to get into that. So, John, I love connecting with educators around areas of passion and learning outside of the classroom and outside of your practice. So tell us about an area of learning that's happening for you completely outside of the school context. Yes. And I looked at this and I thought about the question and I jotted some notes down and then I thought to myself, well, John, you really didn't answer this correctly. But then I think I did because I put down soccer with my son. And that is an area in which, as a parent, and this, this kind of goes along with what I've mentioned before and what we've talked about, and as an educator, it's easy to feel guilty that you're not spending enough time with family members. And I have a seven-year-old son and a 13-year-old daughter. And my son, my son and I have recently started playing soccer every night. And it, it, what's, ama- what's so much fun about it is that it's exercise for me, which I need. It's time with my son. And then we're having a blast. And it's just, it's, I'll be honest, I think after I get done recording this, I'm thinking about taking him to go get some cleats because we slide around all over the backyard. We don't have cleats for wearing tennis shoes and I've got these little tiny goals, but it's just, it's one of my favorite parts of the night. Some nights I'm exhausted, I'm tired. And in all honesty, some nights I don't feel like playing, but my son says, daddy, you promised we're going to play every night. And I said, yes, I did. And so we're going to do it even if it's 15 minutes. And some nights, actually a lot of nights recently, it's been in the dark. And so it takes about 10 minutes for our eyes to adjust out there. But just having that 20 to 30 minutes where we go out there and just play one-on-one soccer with these little tiny goals, is just, it's a blast. And it's, it keeps me going. It's getting me in shape too. <laughs> I love that, John. One of the things I love the most about that actually is I think the modern family is sort of wrestling with getting away from screens. You know, we have these moments where every member of the house after dinner or whatever is sort of plugged into their screen of choice. And I think those... Those times of completely screen-free, I call it eyeball time, are so important. And yeah, I think that absolutely that can be an area of learning and certainly passion and growth. So very, very cool. That's a little bit convicting for me to hear, I got to tell you, but I've got two boys at home and definitely not playing sports with them every day, but uh, trying to get out and do something. And then, John, let's get back to the productivity piece. So 
as you said, you're a busy administrator and podcaster. You're an education influencer. And so how do you, and, and not to mention a husband and father. So how do you balance all these different responsibilities? What are some of the tools or, or maybe a tried and true trick that is working for you in terms of boosting your productivity and contributing to your success? I try to focus on the big things. And there are certain things that I just let go. I don't worry about. I don't worry about, and I, I'm not a neat freak. And luckily from, you know, neither is my wife. We spend quality time. We, we And I don't, you know, <laughs> I don't think she'd hear that and be upset. I mean, we, you know, we, we don't worry about certain things. And so some people, they need to be organized, need to have things perfect. And that's fine. But I think picking the big bucket items, the big rocks, and staying focused on them helps me a lot because it's very easy to get sidetracked and think, you know what, I need to do this or I need to do that. And I think what really matters to me, it's you know spending time with my family. It's when I'm at work, it's my job. And it's tough because there there is a lot. And sometimes, sometimes good enough is good enough. And sometimes it's not. And I know that sounds cliche and people are probably wondering what in the world I mean by that. But there's certain things that, you know, we don't need to stress and put every single ounce of energy into it. And like, for example, for uh, educators listening who are taking grad classes, I give this advice and I don't know if this is good or bad advice, but I'm, I've given it before and I'm going to give it today. I, I tell them, you know, when you take a grad class in education, you can spend six or seven hours on a paper and you'll probably get a 97 or a 98, or you can spend two hours and get a 91 or a 92. And I say, think about those other five hours. I mean, does, does it, and now if it matters that much to you to get that 98 or that 97, then go ahead and do it by all means. But in general, what I've found is that some things that that extra three or four times the time isn't worth it. It's almost like the 80-20 rule or the 20-80. I don't know what order you put those in. The 28, you know, the Pareto principle where you, you know, you, you, you get the most, 20% of the things in your life bring 80% of the results. And I try to really pinpoint what those 20% are. That is so rich, John. You know, one thing I've really noticed from some of the best administrators I've ever served under is that value of efficiency. And you kind of referenced Stephen Covey's work earlier, but just that idea of getting things done. And, you know, wow, we can get mired down in the details, can't we? And uh, I think you're right. We just need to figure out what needs to get done, get it done and move on. So. That's that's a fantastic tip that I think I'm going to be taking with me. Now, John, we're moving into some rapid fire recommendations. I'm going to try to do less talking here and just let you fill us in with your top picks because that is where the value is at, my friends. So let's start at Twitter. Every educator's starting point for a solid PLN. Who do we need to follow there? Who have you discovered lately that is really lighting you up and adding value to your activity there? I'd say one person who is a buddy of mine named Oscar Zimmerman is he's on Twitter. He has written a couple books. He's written a book called Crush School, uh, Crush School 2, or I, I should know the name of this. He's going to kill me that I don't know the name of this, but he's written <laughs> books on, on productivity. And they're really, really good. My daughter actually was one of the reviewers for the first book. And he gives short, easy to digest tips that can help middle high school students, even adults, be more successful and become more productive. His writing is very engaging. It's conversational while at the same time, it's it's research-based. I mean, this is one of the smartest dudes I know. And his blog pieces always, always astound me just because he finds some little angle, some little edge. They're humorous. But at the same time, you come away and you thought, you know what, I'm a little bit smarter after reading his pieces and his, his books are just amazing. Excellent. Excellent. Look forward to looking him up. And then next, John, point to an ed tech tool that you see your teachers using well in their practice or perhaps something you're using in your own practice that is adding value for you. Without a doubt, Voxer for me, because it allows me to communicate with educators from around the country, around the world really, but mostly around the country. And I'm part of a Voxer group that's very diverse and it allows you an intimacy in the sense that you can share things that you might not normally share with a colleague you work with. And, and you can be, speaking of vulnerability, I mean, you can be very vulnerable. And over a couple of years, you grow to know these people. And the group that I'm a part of is about 10 or 12 folks. And you go on there and sometimes you might share something that has nothing to do with education. Sometimes it does. But the ability to hear someone's voice and their intonation and the emotion and the, the ability to be able to reach out on there and say, look, I've got a problem. What would you do if this was you? Here's what, here's what just took place at my school today. How would you fix that? How would you handle that? It's just amazing. And at first, I, 
it's called a walkie talkie app. And I thought this is a stupid thing. This isn't going to be any good, but what's amazing with it is it's, I don't know if the word is right, but I think it's asynchronous. In other words, I can leave a message and then the person it, it, it's in the chat. Then someone else in my group can listen to it two hours from now, tonight, tomorrow. So you don't have to be on at the same time. So it's just a continued conversation. You listen and talk whenever you want. And so it's, it's very, very powerful. John, recommend a book, one that you've been reading lately, maybe, or perhaps one of your all-time faves, and tell us why you recommend it. A book I recently finished was called is called Girl Wash Your Face by Rachel Hollis. Because I'm I'm very in tune to social emotional learning and just sort of help books that help people feel better about themselves. And I kept seeing this book on you know the bestseller list. It's the number one book on Amazon, the number one book here, the number one book there. And Rachel writes in very in a very conversational tone, but she's very open. She's very honest. She doesn't hold anything back. And you know, I thought, in all honesty, a lot of my audience, most of my audience is probably women, and most educators are women. So I thought, okay, what matters to women? What are women reading? And I don't mean just women are reading this book. I'm sure just as many men, or maybe close to that number, are reading the book as well. But I thought, I want to know what matters to them. And the book is really good. So I would highly recommend it. Girl, wash your face. I am seeing her name everywhere these days, so good pick there. And then, John, we know you're a podcast listener. You're definitely a podcast producer. So what other podcasts are you listening to on your commute that are adding value for your professional practice? One of my favorites is called, it's a hashtag M rating with Jess and KJ. And that's with uh, Jessica Leahy and KJ Del Antonio. And they're both amazing writers. And they, they talk about all aspects of writing. They talk about writing books, pitching books, uh, editing, what they're reading. Just it has everything to do with writing. And it's just the, the ins and outs that you never knew. I mean, they basically take you in into their worlds for about 30 minutes each week. And I have found that to be really amazing. And it's very casual. And it's just fun. I mean, they're... You can tell they're good friends. They get along well. And it's just, it's a fun podcast to listen to. And I, I learn a lot about the ins and outs of writing and, and writer's life. Very cool. Look forward to that one too. And then the last two questions here, John, are about video. So I hope you're a YouTube subscriber. We know some educators are not, but is there a YouTube channel that you've really enjoyed? This might be one that helps you professionally or one that you just find amusing. YouTube is a dangerous rabbit hole. I know that, but <laughs> I, because I can go on YouTube and come back an hour later and I don't, I don't even know what I've done. I've seen 17 different things, but yeah. one of my favorite channels that I subscribe to is Shots of All with Jason Silva. And he is like a modern day poet, philosopher, motivational speaker. And he has these three to five minute videos that are just absolutely beautifully pr produced. He's brilliant. The the videos are brilliant. I mean, they're, they're beautiful to look at and he's just nonstop energy. He's the guy who hosts Brain Games on, uh, I can't think of the name of the channel, but they're just unbelievable and they, they're on every topic you can imagine. So that's my favorite YouTube channel. All right. Shots of all with Jason Silva. And I will make sure to get all of these links up on teachersonfire.net. If you're listening away and you're you're trying to write some of these down while you're driving, maybe stop doing that and just check out <laughs> check out the show notes later. But last question, John, just for fun, when you're at the end of your day and you've got no energy left for anything remotely productive, what are you watching on Netflix these days? A month or two ago, I would have said nothing because I really don't watch TV. But my wife has got me into a show that is absolutely amazing. It's called Atypical. And it's basically about a family that the, the son, brain freeze, the son has autism and he is in high school. And basically the ins and outs of what daily life is like with him, with the people around him. I mean, it's not just about him, but the, the actor that plays this young man is brilliant. The show is brilliant. It, it's funny. I don't know if you've seen it or not, but it's just, it's just absolutely it is unbelievable to me. I can't wait to see the next episode. I'm not caught up. I'm on season two, but just it's, it'll make you laugh. It'll make you cry. It's just so good. And it gives you a whole different perspective into one portion of autism. I know this is not how every single autistic person is by any means, but it just, it gives you a new insight into someone with autism. For sure. Yeah. I love that vote because I think you're right. I think every educator will find some value and some entertainment in, in atypical as well. We, we all know we're facing autism and I think the rates are still going up, aren't they? In terms of the 
are the numbers of our learners struggling with autism. And I think so. I yes. think, yeah. And I think, you know, coming to a better understanding of, of autism and some of the challenges associated, you know, they walk you through, they walk you through what, what romance looks like for an autistic yes, child. Yes. And it's pretty, it's pretty fun stuff. But John, uh, speaking of fun, this has been so good to chat with you. And what a pleasure, again, for me just to spend some real life time with a voice I've had in my car and ear- in my earbuds quite a bit. So, John, what are the best ways for the listeners to follow you and get more of that great content? Probably the best way for someone to follow me would be for podcasts. It's on the BAM Radio Network. That's where both My Bad and Teacher's Aid can be found. And my main social media platform is Twitter. And I can be found at John Harper 70 BD. All right. Sounds good, John. Thanks again so much for sharing your time with us today. I know it's very valuable. So we appreciate it on behalf of all of the educators listening. Thank you so much. Take care and let's talk again soon. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Tim. This was fun. Thanks for listening to this episode of Teachers on Fire, where teachers come to share, learn and be inspired. Please subscribe to the podcast, leave us a review on iTunes, and follow us on Twitter at Teachers on Fire. I'm your host, Tim Cavey, saying goodbye for now, and we'll catch you next time right here on the Teachers on Fire podcast.